Welcome to the third video based on a talk I would have given to the Ulster Archaeology Society but for the coronavirus lockdown. In part one, we considered the osteological and artefactual evidence, concluding that it points to the existence of civilian militias rather than any elite class of warriors. In part two, we concluded that damage to Irish Bronze Age blades had mainly contemporary ritual causes, with use or analysis also showing substantial modern reuse. In part three, we'll continue to look at how material culture might be used to interpret late prehistoric societies, now focusing on the decorative motifs that appear on both ceramic and metalwork. We'll ask if these patterns were simply decorative or held some deeper significance for the societies that produced them. The ornamentation on Bronze Age metalwork is clearly derived mainly from that on bigger pottery, best seen on vessels such as cinnery urns. Although there have been few attempts to attribute any possible meaning to these motifs. The preferential placement of cinnery urns in older burial sites has long been recognised. Here, they were generally inverted over the ashes of individual males, females, and occasionally children. It's been suggested that they might have served a similar purpose to that of Etruscan hut urns, although the practice first appeared in Britain and Ireland at a much earlier date. It's been argued that once the concept of cinnery urns reached Ireland, their subsequent development was largely insular with limited external influences. More recently, attention has returned to the question of the direction of travel of those influences. Did they originate in Northern or Southern Europe, or both? The concentration of collared urns, for example, has become increasingly more evenly spread as newer discoveries are made. But cordon urns are clearly a northern phenomenon. Two conflicting theories about the nature of any external influences have been called cultural diffusion, where the spread of ideas and goods is the main driver of change, and demic expansion, where change is due to the migration of people, which in Ireland's case would have could have originated in northern or southern continental Europe. The earlier northern corded ware culture was marked by single animations which included pots and stone battle, battle axes. While in the south, campiform pots and copper daggers would become common grave goods. In both traditions, bands and triangles were popular decorative motifs with strong funerary associations. These motifs also appear on artefacts such as these stone plaques used to support a demic expansion hypothesis. Physical characteristics have also been used to determine racial origins. An approach that went out of favour after the mid 20th century. Bioarchaeology can now explore the Neolithic Bronze Age transition using a broader range of evidence than simple craniofacial metrics. Ancient DNA analysis has confirmed that Neolithic farmers did not follow the Western route suggested by Crawford for the eye goddess, challenging our preconception of their probable appearance. ADNA has also shown that Ireland's Bronze Age population originated in the Pontic Steppe. Media coverage of these revelations is seldom anything short of sensationalist. And based on little or no material evidence. Vividly describing how these mounted barbarians swept through, somehow merging with the Beaker culture, and slaughtering all in their path in some drunken frenzy. So, what do we really know about the Beaker people? One important individual is the Amesbury archer. His impressive array of grave goods suggests that, in addition to being a bowman, 
He was also an accomplished metalworker. Bioarchaeology has shown that he did not grow up in Britain or Ireland, but reflects larger migration across Europe and South Asia, which looked very similar to the movement of Maria Gimbetus's Kurgan people. Gimbetus held that the original inhabitants of Europe formed peaceful matriarchal societies with earthbound goddesses and a belief in earthly regeneration. The incoming Indo-Europeans replaced this social order with a patriarchal model headed by a male warrior elite, as evidenced by the appearance and use of thrusting metal weapons. But, as we've seen, some of this evidence is deeply flawed. The other strand of evidence drawn on to support a violent and oppressive patriarchy is the supposed replacement of goddesses with a pantheon of celestial deities. Which brings us to the contentious subject of belief systems, where the treatment of the dead could hold vital clues. Parallels have been drawn between cinerary urns and hut urns, with adjustments made for the construction techniques used for Bronze Age roundhouses. Closer examination of the motifs used on cinerary urns reveals the, the use of four core elements. Crescents, which might represent cyclicity or seasonality. Horizontal chevrons, which commonly represent water. Vertical chevrons, which can represent plants such as cereal or trees. Horizontal bands and triangles, neither of which have any obvious meaning. But it seems unlikely that these motifs alone would be completely meaningless. Confirmation of the meaning might be sought in the earlier use of these motifs. Nested crescents frequently appear as rock art and are generally assumed to have some celestial significance. The nested crescent motif is also found in a range of ceramics, including cinerary urns. Gold lunula and jet spacer plate necklaces, in themselves nested crescents, are generally associated with band and triangle motifs. The location of these on the lunula seems to reflect that on the jet necklace. The cruciform and wheel motifs that appear on the base of many funerary vessels can be rolled out to reveal a band and triangle motif. And wheel motifs are so called due to the radiant spoke pattern, which would have been unknown to contemporary potters. The earliest depiction of a wheeled vehicle in Europe is accompanied by plant and water motifs on a Neolithic pot. The celestial motifs on campiform pots and gold sun can also be interpreted as band and triangle motifs. Comparisons have been made between Danish solar disks and possible Irish examples. But closer examination reveals a preponderance of triangles in Irish disks and a distinct lack of spirals. Similar patterns are seen on some other European disks. While some concentric circles appear on Irish gold bulla, the predominant motif is again the band and triangle combination. Irish decorated axes also display the band and triangle combination, either in isolation or in association with crescent and chevron motifs. While the band and triangle combination can be seen in other decorated articles, such as bronze sunflower paint, the full crescent, chevron, band and triangle repertoire is best seen on funerary vessels and contemporary flat axes. To determine if there might be anything comprehensible in Taylor's motif library, we might consider Champion's decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. One of the sites he visited was the Temple of Hathor in Dendra, 
where the defaced image of the goddess can still be made out. Such forward-facing images are extremely rare in Egyptian art and is thought to relate to the foreign origins of this hybrid mistress of the beasts. Gold piriform pendants of the goddess were popular across the Near East and could be represented using only a few key features. These are also incised on stone plaques and animal long bones, appearing as far west as southern Iberia by the late Neolithic. The motifs used on bone eye idols also appears on pottery. In addition to large distinctive eyes, we see nested crescents, a family of cervids, and the now familiar band and triangle motif. This and several other recurring features were common across time and space. The Egyptian goddess was furnished with the complete set, with little missing from gold plaque or animal bone versions, a zoological reference in themselves. All seem to have travelled well. However, Near Eastern zoomorphic components would find little resonance in Ireland. And taboos about the depiction of living things could further reduce what might be acceptable. The use of punches and stamps to reproduce the four core components would have resulted in a further reduction in complexity. As its principal use may have been to clear land for farming, the axe could have been regarded as an implement of fertility. While the same motifs on a cinerary urn could represent regeneration and renewal with the vessel acting as a womb within Mother Earth. Such regeneration would come to be symbolised by the Ouroboros, the Jungian Great Round, also depicted as the symbol of infinity. The Jungian archetype of the Great Mother can be extended back to the Paleolithic, with cinerary urns forming part of a woman equals body equals vessel equals womb tradition. So, while there may be no Irish Bronze Age mother goddess figurines, there was ubiquitous use of mother goddess symbolism. Based on the material evidence, rather than focus on warrior elites and celestial pantheons, Bronze Age societies were much more concerned with the universal basics of fertility and regeneration. In part four, we'll consider the contents of cinerary urns, which apart from cremated bones, and quite often food vessel, can contain a variety of apparently personal grave goods, including ornaments and material artefacts. We will also look at the main influences on Irish metalwork, ranging from Iberia to the Rhine Delta and beyond. Ireland's contribution to both the British and Continental Bronze Age will be examined through the distribution of Irish material culture. Thank you.